Project Publish, the reality show for writers and performers. I'm your host, Richard Graves, and I'm here with our eight remaining contestants. Our four performers are seated, and our four writers are standing. The format of our show is simple. At the end of last week's show, we randomly paired our writers and performers and issued a writing challenge. This week, it was for a scene from a sci-fi novel or story. The writers had three days to write, then they met midweek with their partner to collaborate and had until midnight to make changes and submit their finished manuscript. The performer then had three days to memorize lines, decide on costume, and hone their presentations. You'll see those performances live in just a few minutes. But first, let's check in with our participants. Now, Rebin, you have looked like you've aged since last week. Tell us about that. Well, I had back problems, and then between my three kids, I woke up this morning, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm hoping after the show, a massage will turn me back. <laughs> okay, well, I, we're looking forward to your performance. Okay, now, last week, there was a lot of enthusiasm when the word sci-fi was mentioned. So, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you have actually dressed up as a space alien and gone to a, a sci-fi conference of some sort? Okay, uh, Trevor, tell us about uh, what, uh, the most recent one where you've done something like that. Um, I was recently at a sci-fi convention which was, had a zombie theme and I was going to be in the costume contest. Unfortunately, usually you have a room at the hotel when you're going to do this, and I didn't because it was really close to my house. So I'm in the bathroom of a very nice hotel putting on zombie makeup. <laughs> And I'm standing here and I'm making this thing on the side of my face and I'm ripping it open and pouring blood in there. And, and this little girl walks up to me and she's like looking and she says, what are you doing? And her mother's behind her going, please don't frighten my child. And I'm going, well, I'm trying to be scary, dear. Do you think I'm doing a good job? And she's like, and her mother's, thank you, thank you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now, Ethan. Yes. You, were in, you had surgery this week and you're here ready to perform. How are you feeling? How are those painkillers doing for you? I'm doing good. It's been kind of a loopy uh, few days, <laughs> but the cheeks are not as puffy as I thought they were going to be, so I'm doing okay. And Laurie, you've, you've made a trip south. Yeah, tell us about that. Yes, after we got done with our working session, I went home and made a couple tweaks to my story, set it off, uh, loaded up the car, and then we drove to Louisiana <laughs> to see my daughter graduate from school on Friday. Then yesterday about noon, we loaded up the car and drove back and got here uh, about 11 o'clock today. So I feel like Revan looks. <laughs> <laughs> and I almost cried when I heard that Ashley slept almost till showtime. <laughs> and Ashley, yeah, you were a little bit late. This, the, why was that? Um, uh, I slept through my alarms. And alarms. You, okay. <laughs> and you didn't, did you realize it was daylight savings time? Uh, I did before I went to bed. <laughs> okay, but the alarm didn't work. Okay, let's meet our judges. Our first judge who concentrates on our writing is Don Bingle. Uh, Don is a published author. Uh, now, Don, you attend a lot of gaming uh, functions. Do you, have you ever dressed up as a sci-fi personality? No, I, I haven't dressed up for the gaming conventions that I go to. Uh, most uh, um, uh, role-playing gamers uh, do not dress up as characters. That's more for the sci-fi conventions and kind of kind and things like that. But you have written and published sci-fi material. Tell, tell us a little bit about that and where viewers could get to read your work. Well, I've written uh, a number of uh, sci-fi uh, short stories and my first novel, Force Conversion, is a near future uh, military science fiction. All of those can be found by uh, going on Amazon uh, for Kindle and putting in the last name Bingle, B-I-N-G-L-E, or uh, um, you can do the same thing on Nook, or go to my website. Okay, thanks. Now, when you announced the challenge last week, um, you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned space opera, and you mentioned steampunk. For those of our viewers who aren't sci-fi junkies, can you explain what they are? Well, uh, space opera is, uh, uh, Star Wars is generally regarded as space opera. It's, it's, a, it's a story that could occur anywhere, but happens to occur in a science fiction setting. 
Um, steampunk is uh, an alternate history. Uh, it's basically uh, an era in the past, but imagining that the future arrived sooner than it did and that it was powered by steam. So uh, the stories uh, tend to be set in the uh, 19th, early, early 20th century. Uh, and uh, there's very little that is done with electricity, but there, all of the gadgets that we have today exist. They're just powered by mechanical gears and steam power. Okay. So our next judge is our guest judge for this week. He's co-founder of Waterline Writers here in Batavia, Kevin Moriarty. Kevin, uh, please tell us about yourself and tell us why you started Waterline Writers. Well, Waterline Writers was started in uh, February of 2012. Ann Vague, a uh, lady here in town, and I founded it. Um, we hold literary events on the third Sunday of every month at 7 p.m. at Water Street Studios here in town. Um, we've hosted fiction writers, poets, playwrights, screenwriters. Um, we've shown lots of different formats and genres. Um, we get a pretty good crowd. I, I think we've averaged around 60 people per event, which is pretty nice, and, and it's a good time. Our next event is a week from today, Water Street Studios at 7 p.m., and Don here is one of our featured authors that night. Okay. Now, one of the prizes for uh, the winning writer for Project Publish is something that you're providing. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm part of the Fox Valley Writers Group, and we meet at Messenger Library in North Aurora, and in January of this year, we put our uh, first anthology together, and we published that on Kindle on uh, CreateSpace and also Nook. And as part of that process, we learned quite a bit about publishing an ebook. And I'm just really happy to share that with uh, the winner of Project Publish and help them get their material out to the public. That's fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Richard. OK, our third judge is Amber Mitchell, who focuses on our performers. Now, Amber, you choose not to see the scripts or know what the performer is thinking of doing um, before the performance, whereas Don does read the scripts because he's looking at the, the writing and he needs to do that. Why is that? Why don't you want to see the script? Well, because I want to make sure that I don't have any preconceived notions when I read the piece, how I would direct it or how I would interpret it as a character, actor, and so I want it to be fresh when I see what they're doing and then also to see what they do with the material as quickly as they can within that time frame of four minutes and with character development without me trying to be a director in my head ahead of time with what they're doing. Okay, yeah. thanks. And is there anything particular you're looking for this week as they do sci-fi? They, oh, this is a tough one because they have to make it believable even though it's not. Um, so I'm looking for honesty in portrayal of insane characters. I think that's probably the best way to put it. Okay, thanks Amber. So let's get to the performances. First up, are Laurie O'Connor Stephens and Steve Polis. Let's find out a little bit more about these contestants. Roll that tape. New and exciting experience, and um, S Steve is apparently a big sci-fi freak, so that only added to the pressure and uh, stress and everything. But I will always, when I perform my piece, uh, try to you know, give my own interpretation and then adjust to what the, the writer's original idea is. I've gotten to know the performers better. I think there is a little bit of writing for the performer. Um, I was really thrilled to have Steve again because we worked together before and I knew he'd be up for this task, so absolutely. The house that I live in is one giant prop house and with costumes everywhere. You can't take one stop without tripping over something that's either a costume or a prop. And I like trying to use that to my advantage. We'll see what happens happens when the judging comes, but I know he's going to rock the house with it because I, I can tell that already just from the first couple of readings. And wait till you see him with his head shaved. That's really going to be uh, something. No, Laurie, uh, please introduce your piece for us. Um, my story is about um, some aliens from another planet who have come up with a plan for taking over the Earth, starting with the United States. And this is their general. Um, this scene is their general who is reporting back to the high commander after the first test of the um, plan. Okay, Steve, are you ready? <laughs> then your time starts now. This is General Goem, mission leader of the envoy to the planet Earth. I request permission to make a report to the High Commander. High Commander, there is no need to attack the humans. Thanks to their primitive tendencies coupled with the effects of Serum 2121, they will destroy each other. 
within three lunar rotations, Earth will be a colony of Veracity 3. Phase one of the operation has commenced. The test site? Batavia, Illinois. A small town located in the Midwestern United States on the continent of North America. This site was chosen due to its proximity to Fermilab, the Particle Accelerator Laboratory, which has been under our control for nearly four decades now. Shortly after sunrise, our flitter, cloaked to mimic a 20th century crop dusting plane, circled the area and began seeding the clouds with the serum. The drought, locally, was a plausible explanation for any curious observers. Within minutes, a light rain began to fall upon the town. The effect was immediate. And as expected, and as expected, everyone in Batavia must now tell the absolute truth. Our monitoring devices report that chaos has erupted. Specifically, a high-pitched wail has been identified from the females of the species. Apparently, their male counterparts have never answered honestly when asked, does this outfit make me look fat? People are being trampled in mass exodus after a hiring event when local uh, employers when lo local employers were forced to provide accurate salary and benefit numbers, the applicants also could no longer use their resumes. Meanwhile, in other areas, an eerie silence prevails as telemarketers were rendered mute and mechanics cash registers have stopped ringing. Finally, a group of local leaders have barricaded themselves inside against a deep angry, growing mob who have found out a, a deep, shared secret just revealed. All of these leaders apparently hate bulldogs. These localized results prove definitively, and I recommend we proceed with Operation Pinocchio. Although our forces are ready, I recommend not only a global effort, but rather than focusing on just the United States. After extensive reconnaissance, it is apparent that we no longer need to blanket just the United States for the desired results, freeing up the serum for use elsewhere. To cripple the United States, we only have to rain down on Washington, D.C. Lord High Commander, I remain your obedient servant and await further instruction. Honest. This is a uh, uh, acute story, um, and it appeals to uh, uh, people uh, from the local area. Uh, I got to say that it's not the most alien of worlds uh, where Earth's set here, but it does have uh, the required uh, sci-fi tie to it. Um, and I will say that uh, the performance, enthusiastic. Um, but the, the writing was actually a little bit cleaner than the performance in terms of language use and sentence structure. Um, so uh, um, just a, a little bit of a drop on the performance there. Um, the writing is, I think, very, very clean. Um, not the, the most thrilling sci-fi in the world, but uh, a solid effort. Um, I agree with Don. Um, I didn't really think it had a real strong science fiction feel. Um, I didn't feel there was much story there, you know, in terms of character or conflict. Um, but I liked it. I mean, it was, an, it was very humorous, a great premise. Um, I think it reads a little more like an essay than a story, but a good essay. Um, in terms of the performance, I'm going to give you points for the costume and the props. I thought they actually added <laughs> nicely to, to, to the entire uh, presentation. I will agree with the fact that it was very one note as far as you could have taken the material as an actor and given us a beginning, a middle, and an end. It would have been nice to have more interaction with that other nebulous person that you were reporting to. I think it was like you were, it was constant word babble and we didn't get the idea that you were interacting with someone that was probably making 
commentary on what you were saying, where you could have used more emotional depth and breadth with that. Um, I would have liked to have seen you use the, the globe on the table. It kind of sat there, and I thought, touch the globe. Uh, the map was nice. That was really cool. The costume was fun. But, and the pictures were great to use those. But if you're going to use paper to read from, which is perfectly fine, make sure you don't go too far down the page. You were, we lost you. Some, we lost your head. We lost everything. So, but overall, pretty good. That's it from here, Richard. Okay. Our next contestants are Ashley Welsh and Eric Polis. Let's to get, let's get to know them a little bit better. Roll the tape. I might not have a costume this week uh, because I believe that uh, an actor doesn't need a costume to portray a character. I just found it difficult writing this week. Uh, if I start today, yes, um, that I'll have it memorized by Sunday. I like it when the um, performer inputs a lot. Act out uh, one of the characters that uh, was in her story and we changed the age of the character because uh, she liked that. But um, I try not to uh, encourage it too much because I just want to fit the role that she imagined in her story. First, then I just kind of leave it to them. Then I remember I should probably consider the performer. Ashley. Tell us the title of your piece and then set the scene for us. Um, the title is called Welcome to Toy Lake and it's about the protagonist, Taylor, who falls into a lake which leads to another world. He is skeptical about where he is and has not yet considered that he's not on Earth. Okay. Eric, when you're ready, your time starts now. Hey, what you got there? What is it, a knife? It's none of your business. What'd you do, kill somebody? Leave me alone. Who was it, a rival? I didn't kill anyone. My name's Edo. That's spelled E-T-C-H-O. But the C-H is silent. I didn't ask for your name. What's your name? You're not a Metlian. A what? See, I knew that. You have no horns or dorsal line or anything cool. <laughs> what are you, an idiot? What on earth are you talking about? Earth? You're kidding, right? Earth? The planet? The dirt? There's nothing but sand and glass transparent trees here. Is that some sort of a flower? <laughs> you must be joking. What's with your back? It's so smooth! Hey, don't touch what doesn't belong to you! But your thing seems so interesting. I mean, what happened to your knife? It felt like nothing was in there. Are you kidding? You stupid or something? This is an eternity bag. Hmm. Ah! What's with these trees? No, you're not supposed to touch the trees. They're made of glass, you see? Please. Get rid of the blood before... Hey, shut up, will ya? I gotta clean my wound. Please, hurry up. It, it can smell blood. Hey, what did I just say? I know what I'm doing. Instant wound healing since 2056. What's with the serum? It suddenly feels hot. Run! See. Well, this is interesting because the performance stripped out a lot of the narrative and stuck primarily to the dialogue. Um, there are some uh, clever bits in this, um, some of which we, we saw in the performance, some of which were in the narrative. Uh, the glass in the trees, the fact that uh, the glass blocks that you were talking about uh, actually caused the landscape in, in the written version uh, to warm up because the sun's refracting through all of the glass. Uh, th those are clever bits. Uh, I do have to say that uh, it was absolutely clear in the performance who was talking. In the written version, that was not always as clear, um, which uh, threw me off a little bit. And although I have a vague idea of what the setting looked like uh, from the written word, uh, there were some confusing aspects to that um, that, uh, that made me uh, trip up as I tried to get into the story. Kevin? Um, clearly a science fiction fantasy, very nice uh, from that aspect. Um, when I read the manuscript, I too, as Don said, got confused as to who was talking when, but you, you handled it well in the performance. I think it was very clear the way you made it. Uh, you differentiated between the characters. 
Um, actually, the manuscript was a bit rough. There was a lot of punctuation and syntax issues in it. Um, on a positive note, I like the ending. Very good cliffhanger ending. Um, I'd certainly like to know what's going to happen to this person. So nice job on that part. Um, it was good, except you kept turning your back to us. You didn't cheat out enough, so we, as they say, there are no butts in theater. So I would be just aware of that, cognizant of where your body's at. Um, you did a great job differentiating characters. It was really nice with body posture and vocalization. I really like that. Good use of the prop, really, really believable with what you had. You didn't need a sound effect for the goo. It was okay. You could have left that out. <laughs> But I really thought you did a, a good job with a, a script that was kind of really flaky on the outside. So I liked it. Thank you. Back to you, Richard. OK, our next contestants are Ren Roberts and Rebin Roy. Let's hear what they have to say on the interview. I feel much more comfortable when I memorize. I usually will try and have the script somewhere off if I need it. I've written a lot of science fiction. Um, one of the big projects that I worked on when I was in college was this big, plotty, bombastic science fiction thriller involving robots and murder plots and Russians. <laughs> to have input from the writer, because I want to make sure that I'm bringing the words that they put on the paper to life. Can we not memorize the script? <laughs> I am definitely... A, a woman writer like there's no bones about that so like when I had kind of had the the guys before I was kind of like well I, you can be who you are but I'm gonna write what I'm gonna write and you just kind of have to deal with it which is you know why we kept having dudes playing ladies and really throw me threw me for a loop this week I expected something I guess maybe cliche sci-fi and I think this is gonna be a very interesting uh, spin on sci-fi and I think actually the most nervous I've been. Ren, introduce your piece for us, please. Um, well, I wrote a science fiction piece that's more in the speculative genre. Um, it's about how instead of solving a lot of problems, society and medical doctors put band-aids on things instead of actually solving problems. OK, Rebin, when you're ready, your time starts now. You are outside. Oh, geez, I've gone and heard it again. It's like that thing with the clocks, you know, with the tick, tick, ticking. It took me almost a week to unhear it last time, and I had to hum that song from the Disney World ride for almost an hour. You are outside. Yeah, I know. I can see I'm outside. I shouldn't be so bitter. It's for the patience. I can't imagine being that kind of crazy, so unaware of everything. It must involve some special kind of terror to make that you are outside the best option. It is a calm voice, though I've always found it disconcerting how there's just this gentle woman talking to me, to everyone from above and behind. Sometimes when I hear it, I turn around and I'm temporarily frightened that no one is there. You are in the hallway. I don't really get how it works. I feel like someone explained it to me before, something about nanoparticles or subconscious sound waves. But that was a long, long time ago, and I don't, I don't even remember where I was back then. It must have been here. You are in the hallway. Sometimes I wonder if everyone hears the same voice. Is it some location-specific pre-recording that's pumped in like some sort of cheap perfume? Or is it someone's job? Do men hear a man's voice? Oh, so many questions. Be careful, you are on the stairs. Now that's solid. When you're a stage one Alzheimer's patient who thinks you're an 18 year old athlete, being on the stairs, being careful is just good advice. Though they probably shouldn't be on the stairs anyway. You are in the common space. What was I doing? It's that stupid voice. Oh, so hard to keep track. All right, keys. I, I was going home. My shift's over. How'd it get so late anyway? The day always goes so quickly when no one tries to run away or no one gets lost. I like the days without the screaming. When I know, days without the, it's okay, Mary, you're safe. I'm here to help. You are in the elevator. The more I think about it, the more I can, I'm convinced the voice is to make families feel better. You are in the atrium. I hope when I'm that old and demented, my kids just kill me. I hate watching these old people lose themselves as they just wait to die. Just cut to the chase, eh? Oh, 
besides, who wants to hear voices for the rest of their lives like some kind of rational schizophrenic? Not me. Work is hard enough. You are in the parking lot. You should not be here. Where did I park that infernal car? I drove the Buick, didn't I? Or was it the Ford? Oh my gosh, someone's stolen my car! How am I gonna get home? It's my turn to pick up the kids! Oh my god, oh my god! Wait, there's my car. You are in an auto car. Auto car? What? This is just a car! This is an auto car. Please return home. Home? That's where I'm going, I think. I cannot let you leave, Mary. What? You can't stop me. Why did it say my name? I'm going home. Where, where do I put the keys? Please go back to the facility. I'm scared. Where am I? Who are you? Nothing's making sense. What's happening? Help! Help! It's okay, Mary. You're safe. I'm here to help. See? This is, uh... Uh, futuristic, it's scary, it's funny. Uh, there's some very nice phrasing in it as written. Uh, even in the written version, you get a clear distinction, maybe even a clearer distinction in the written uh, version than in the performance of the different voices because they're set off with italics um, in, in their own separate paragraphs when she's hearing things in her head. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that people can identify with. I absolutely believe that in the future we'll all be listening to our music by the equivalent of cochlear implant uh, <laughs> and not have to have earphones or earbuds or anything like that. This is the future that's coming uh, and that, that makes it very strong sci-fi. Kevin? Well, I, I thought it was very good. It's very strong sci-fi feel. Kind of a, it, it spans genres a little though. It's kind of got a psychological thriller kind of aspect mm -hmm. to it too. It's, it's got a cool paranormal like X-Files kind of vibe going that I really liked. Um, good build-up. I liked uh, both in the written and in the performance how the tension ratchets up. She gets crazier and crazier as time goes on. Um, I found the ending a little bit of a letdown. I don't know if the crazy voice is benign or evil at this point. And, you know, I know it's only a couple pages, but it would have been, in my opinion, a little nice if uh, it had been a little clearer which way we were headed. But overall, really good job, both of you. It was nice to have the makeup and so forth. That was cute. It really added to it. Um, it took me a minute or two, like 30 seconds, to figure out that there was this nebulous voice. I wasn't sure where it was coming from. So it would have been nice if you'd placed that voice somewhere in one spot so that we knew that wherever you went to that spot, then you were hearing something. Then you could react to it as the person that you were. Um, don't retreat whatever you do. You were backing up as you were working instead of moving forward, if anything. Make sure or hold your ground unless you had a reason to retreat. I didn't think you had a reason to retreat at uh, some of the times when you chose to go backwards. Um, and I also like the fact that you went into the car and I could see the car and I knew that you were in a different place. So that was good. Um, I would have done something with that voice, though. I don't know what I would have done, but... I, like you guys said, I wasn't sure what kind of a voice it was, but I would have done something with it. But overall, very good. I liked it. Okay, our final contestants are Trevor Rodemaker and Ethan Mole. Let's see their interview. I actually wrote two pieces. I wrote a piece that was not good enough for this competition, and after looking at it for about 24 hours, I put it in a drawer and wrote a second one. There'll be like an outfit, but I don't think it'll be like as crazy as you would think. So it'll be fun though. The performer always brings different things to it than I had thought of. And it, every performer that I've worked with has just been so wonderful to see this different perspective of, on my writing and to really talk about it this way. It's great. Well, in case you didn't know, I'm actually getting my teeth pulled out, my wisdom teeth pulled out on Friday. So I don't know what's going to happen. Be drugged out of my mind. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see if I'm going cross-eyed on camera. Traver, please introduce your piece for us. I decided to go with a hard science fiction feel, uh, very realistic on the technology. Um, this is an exploration of one of the moons of Jupiter, which is hopefully going to happen within the lifetimes of the people who are watching the show. Okay. Ethan, your time starts now. I come looking for life, but to me, Europa looked like death. The landscape of Jupiter's second moon stretched out, crystalline white with the red of trace minerals leaking through at the seams nearly flat until it reached the sharply curved horizon. Ice covered the surface, but the moon's volcanic core had cut it into thousands of pieces, 
huge flat chunks floating on a liquid water layer beneath, shifting and refreezing until the surface looked like lace. The red at the seams dominated the pattern. If this moon was lace, it had been touched with blood. I wasn't the kind of girl who usually thought about lace. A marine chemist, I'd spent seven and a half months sailing through space to test the waters of Jupiter's moons, especially Europa, with her miles-deep, ice-coated ocean. I was thinking about aliens. The landing shuttle came down fast and smooth, bumped once as it touched the frozen surface, then taxied smoothly toward the metal composite dome surrounding the big drill. Over our heads, Jupiter, with its huge red spot, loomed like a one-eyed giant in a child's nightmare. Almost before we had stopped, a metallic thumbing came from the vicinity of the airlock, and the seals hissed. I looked to the shuttle's pilot, but he shrugged. That's the locals! He flipped a switch, and the airlock door opened. I put a hand on my face. After seven and a half months in space, I'd gotten used to my transport's recycled air, with its persistent smell of hot metal and the pilot's Greek sardines. But this air was positively foul. Burned rubber and sulfur and confined humanity. Long confined. Some of these folks had been out here for six years. The man coming in from the attached ice skimmer seemed clean enough, though he obviously hadn't shaved in several days. He smiled and shook my hand. You must be Dr. Thatcher. I'm John Halliday. It's good to see a new face. Oh, it's so good to finally meet you in person. I could hardly wait to get my gear set up. How's the laser drill? Is the shaft staying open? Why don't you come over and take a look? The drill's running, and it's impressive. We need to keep the shaft open down to the waterline. When you're making your descent, we'll have to turn it off. I glanced around the cabin at my equipment to my luggage. Uh, I need to check in with Director Yardley, don't I? And some of this equipment is delicate. I'm sure it will keep. John's eyes locked with mine, and there was some urgency in them I couldn't quite fathom. I looked a question at him, and when he nodded and said carefully, I'd love to see the drill in action. Perhaps my things could stay here in the shuttle until after I've met the director? The pilot shrugged. Makes no never mind to me. This boat's got to sit here until I had a shower, at least. I don't leave to pick up the rest of the passengers until 0800 tomorrow. Sounds fine. I looked back quickly at John, then grabbed a duffel and followed him through the airlock. He sealed the tube and broke contact with the shuttle, then revved a surprisingly noisy engine and sped away, skating along at a remarkable speed. Ahead of us, the dome, which had seemed small in the vast emptiness, began to loom larger. I opened my mouth to speak, but he held up a warning hand, checked a couple of readouts, and flipped the switch on a little speaker. Tinny Technopop suddenly filled the little cabin, along with an annoying sound of static. Can you please turn that off? I asked. Nope. Sorry. Can't. He swiveled his head, as if looking for something on the dome. Any important talking gets down out here, with my own little anti-surveillance track in the background. I tried to keep my voice very calm. Why do we need an anti-surveillance track? Because some of the folks out here aren't doing too well with the implications of what we've been learning. Some odd stuff's been going down. Most of us think Dar Director Yardley has lost his mind. Scene. This, this has a nice, strong open. Um, it has a strong close. There's a, a good, technical, hard sci-fi uh, feel to the story, and there's a thriller aspect to go along with the science fiction. Some very nice phrasing. Uh, if this moon was laced, it had been touched by blood. Uh, the one-eyed giant in a child's nightmare. Uh, all, of, all of those things were good phrasing. A little tightening here and there that I could do, but overall, strong. Kevin? Yeah, I agree with Don. It was very good sci-fi, I thought. Um, being a space geek myself, I really appreciated the Europa thing. I noticed it on NASA's homepage the other day. Nice tie-in. Um, <laughs> it was a good setting. I liked the way you brought out the smells of the cabin and the sounds of the airlock, and the dialogue was good. I thought spot on. And uh, I love a cliffhanger ending, and you gave us a good one, so I appreciate that. Um, it was kind of flat as far as just one note uh, acting. Um, it would have been nice to use all those great words. Those were great words. You had some really nice descriptive stuff that you could have lovingly drooled over. And it would have been nice to use breath instead of running one sentence into the next one and the next one. Unless there was a sense of urgency, I would give it, let, give it some time to breathe while you're doing it. Um, choices. I would like to see more choices on your face as far as what those characters are feeling and doing. Um, don't back up. You kept retreating into the black curtain. Don't back up. Go forward. And uh, I would like to know more foreboding, perhaps. That's what I was getting from it, and I wasn't 
quite seen that, that there was a reason for everybody to be a little nervous because this place is not what it seemed to be. But um, there was a lot of verbiage there, so you handled that well. But I would like to have seen more choices and more definitive changes as far as characterization. That's it from the judges. Thanks, Don. Well, in a few moments, we'll find out our final three writers and our final three performers. Don Bingle will announce his final decision for the writers, and Amber Mitchell will announce that decision for the performers. Our judges will make those decisions all the way through to the final show. At that point, you, the viewers, will take over. For the final show, you will vote via social media to decide who the winning writer and who the winning performer of Project Publish are. Ah. To take part in that vote, you must sign in on the Project Publish Facebook group. From Facebook, search for Project Publish and request to join our group. You'll get a notification when the request goes through. During our live final show in two weeks' time, we will open the voting for 10 minutes after the performances are complete. So please join in advance and be ready to vote for your favorite writer and your favorite performer on that show. We will get one vote each for each of those categories. One vote for the writer, one vote for the performer. We'll also take votes from our studio audience and assemble that together for a final decision. Okay, so I think our judges are ready and it's time for the results. We have our four writers here. They're coming in right now. And, and behind them, we have three chairs. One of them goes home. So how are you guys feeling? Huh? Nervous? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don Bingle, give us who, tell us who the best writers were this week. Top two uh, writers this week are Ren and Treva. Okay, you guys can see. Can you two scoot up a little bit there? Okay. Okay. Now, Ashley, you've been here before. Yeah. Laurie, I think this is your first time. Yeah. Okay. Don. Give us your reasoning and your final decision. Um, there were different reasons that the two writers uh, uh, that are in the bottom two are, are in the bottom two. Uh, Lori's uh, story was uh, simple. It was cute. It didn't evoke a very uh, uh, strong sense of an alien or future world. Um, Ashley had some cool ideas, uh, but the bottom line is uh, that um, the writing uh, was not as clean as Lori's. Um, you know, ideas are, are something that every professional writer has a notebook full of. And the bottom line is that um, execution is what it comes down to if you want to be a published writer. Um, and for that reason, I'm sorry, Ashley, but your story ends here. Okay, Laurie, you can sit down. Ashley, so. Tell us what your feelings are. Anything you want to say to the judges or about the being on the show? It's fun being on the show. Um, I have more time on the weekends now. <laughs> so, so you can sleep in next week. Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. I, I, I have here your Project Published T-shirt. Please wear that with pride. Well, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Okay, let's take a look at what the prizes are for our winning writer and our winning performer while our performers come onto stage. Thank you. The winners of Project Publish will get more than bragging rights with a meal at the popular Gammon Coach House, VIP all access passes to the Geneva Film Festival, a K. Hollis original, self publishing guidance for a book on Amazon by Kevin Moriarty. Exclusive participant t-shirts by Johnny Zabka of Spirit Corner. An interview with Rick Hollinger of the Kane County Chronicle. Short story critique by well-known fantasy writer Gene Raby. And $50 gift certificates for Steel Beam Theater in St. Charles. And one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with Lori Holm, manager of Troop Strazi. Okay, for our performers, one of you is going to go home. There are three chairs behind you for... Performers, Amber Mitchell, please tell us who performed the best this week. Um, it was really close between Eric and Rebin. They both did a fabulous job this week. Okay, so you two guys can sit down if you like. So that leaves Ethan and Steve. Um, okay, give us your reasoning and uh, your final verdict. 
Well, I, we were looking for, uh, we talked about the fact that we were looking for something where we had a little bit more of a beginning, a middle, and an end, some kind of an arc with a character, and some definitive choices for that character. And I think um, for this week, uh, Ethan, it's the end this week for you. I'm so sorry, but you've worked hard. Okay, thanks. You can sit down. Ethan. So you struggled back after your surgery yeah. to be here <laughs> and just to get go home. So uh, tell us uh, what, anything you want to say to the judges or how, how it's been on the program for you. Um, I've absolutely loved the show, like the experience here. I came here, like my friend Lori told me like, hey, you know, you should try out, you might enjoy it. Like I've never really had experience with like TV like a ton before and I've always done like stage stuff. So it's pretty much all about learning and the experience. So thank you guys for this. Thank you. Okay. So here's your... T-shirt, wear you. it with pride. You've done right. been a great performer. Thanks. <laughs> Thank Thanks. So, ladies and gentlemen, here are your final three performers. So now it's time to get our new pairings together. And I have here a hat with the name of the three remaining writers. And I'm going to go along the row. They're going to take a name, read it out, and those writers will come and stand behind them. Trevor Rodemaker. Lori O'Connor Stevens. Ren Roberts. Okay, you guys come in. And now for the writing challenge. Don Bingle, what will it be next week? Well, great news for performers. <laughs> Once again, this week's challenge will be for a four minute piece. Even better news for performers. <laughs> This week's challenge for the writers is for each of them to cast their assigned performer as a classic storyteller, whether a bard, court jester, raconteur at an adventurer's club, stand-up comedian, or similar individual whose life, livelihood, or reputation rests on his or her ability to tell a mesmerizing tale. Then, Give them a complete spellbinding story to wow their audience. Format is open. Narrative, dialogue, even epic Norse poetry should you so choose. But the tale must have a clear beginning that grabs the members of the intended audience, a middle which keeps them interested, and an ending that stirs their emotions, assuring the storyteller will live to see another day, another paycheck, or another audience. Make your performer look good. Okay, thank you, Don. Amber, what will you be looking for in that scenario? Oh, it's got to be commitment from the minute they go out there, trying to suck us into the storyline and have, a, have it build to an exciting end so that I'm interested the entire time they're talking. Something's going on that they're acting. I want to be really drawn into whatever the story is, very much so. Okay, thanks, Amber. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kevin, thank you for being our guest judge thank this you. week. Thank you, it was a lot of fun. Okay, the challenge is the same for each writer, yet next week you'll see three unique performances and hear three complete different stories. Join us next Sunday at 2 p.m. for week six of Project Publish when we find out who our finalists will be. I'm Richard Graves and I'll see you then. Thank you for watching.